Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'm going to give you my top nine gut health myths debunked. We're going to talk a bit about carnivore, we're going to talk a bit about oxalates, we're going to talk a bit about SIBO. So get ready to have your mind blown. Gut health myth number one, you can't take pre and probiotics with SIBO. Starting with a good one here, this is going to be very controversial. So let me explain. The way I understand SIBO is a little bit different from most people, I think. And this starts with the fact that I actually hate the, the phrase SIBO. It doesn't make any sense. I understand where the diagnostic label come from. You have more organisms in the small intestine than you are supposed to, and it looks like an overgrowth. So small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. However, small intestinal dysbiosis is more of an accurate representation of what's happening. And when you think about it from a lens of dysbiosis instead of overgrowth, instead of killing, you wanna think about balance. And when you think about it this way, the approach that you're going to need to heal is going to look different depending on how you are out of balance. One of my clients shared this really interesting article with me outlining how someone cured one of their patients of SIBO using prebiotics, using fibers. Now this goes completely against what you might be thinking because when you hear SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, you think if you're going to feed the organisms with fiber, it's going to make the dysbiosis worse. You're going to make the overgrowth worse. But that's exactly the opposite of what happened in this case. Reading directly from the post, the patient was prescribed a triple therapy of two antibiotics and clovulenic acid for four weeks. His symptoms didn't improve and a repeat aspirate found the same levels, 1,012 CFU per milliliter of bacteria in the small intestine. The antibiotic treatment was a failure. Now, I know what you might be saying, taking antibiotics isn't enough. We need to look at motility. We need to look at some other factors. And you're absolutely right. But the thing is, they followed up this treatment with a prebiotic alone and it resolved the SIBO. Reading again from the post, here we can see a complete turnaround in long-term chronic symptoms. After only three days of lactulose treatment, the patient experienced complete resolution of diarrhea and abdominal pain. A third aspirate was taken and the bacterial count had lowered to 107 CFUs per ml. This is a drop from 1,012 CFUs per ml. This means that they reduced the amount of bacteria in the intestine by 10 times by feeding it a prebiotic. Now I'm not saying this is what you need to do. What I'm trying to tell you here is pre and probiotics have an essential place in understanding, in resolving, in healing SIBO, or as I would prefer it to be called, small intestinal dysbiosis. Personally, I'm having a bit of a SIBO flare up right now. And I know many in my situation would jump on some antibiotics or take some antimicrobial herbs but I realized what I've actually been missing is a probiotic that works really well for me. I love the custom probiotics, the D-lactate free and the 11 strain formula. And because I've been traveling a lot recently, I just haven't had access to them. And I've been using some other probiotics that are still good probiotics. I've been using seed. I've been using some soil based organisms like youth and earth and megaspore biotic, but they just don't work for me the same way that these other probiotics do. So the point I'm really trying to make here and the myth that I'm trying to debunk is the only way that you can heal SIBO is with some kind of antibiotic therapy and that probiotics and prebiotics are contraindicated if you have SIBO. That couldn't be further from the truth in certain circumstances as you just saw on this post that I just read to you. If this gentleman didn't use a prebiotic, treating his SIBO probably would not have worked. So you always have to investigate a little bit further and unfortunately, even with the best of testing, there is always some level of trial and error in this process. But don't just disregard probiotics and prebiotics because of what you've read on the internet and people have told you, oh, you have SIBO, you shouldn't take these things. The only way you're gonna know is if you try. Second myth that I wanna debunk today is that sulfur intolerance means you need to avoid all sulfur. Now, first it's worth distinguishing that there are two kind of different types of sulfur intolerance that I'm talking about. The first would be something like hydrogen sulfide dysbiosis, Again, I'm not calling it H2S SIBO because that's not accurate. Let's call it a sulfur imbalanced dysbiosis. And the second could be a more metabolic dysfunction of sulfur intolerance. The main distinction being when you have H2S dysbiosis, you eat sulfur or you're eating foods and you're getting this hydrogen sulfide gas that you can measure on a test or you, you can smell it. You know, it doesn't really smell that great. You probably know if that's you. And on the other side, when consuming sulfur foods, it can cause certain symptoms can be GI discomfort, but this is also more systemic brain fog, aches and pains, autoimmune flare ups, different types of health problems in different areas of the body. 
The thing is, sulfur is actually one of the most abundant minerals that we have in the human body. It's essential. It's like saying you have oxygen intolerance and that you need to stop breathing. Your body cannot function without sulfur. You need it. But if you have some sulfur dysbiosis or some sulfur metabolism problems, then we need to work on this. But this doesn't mean you need to avoid all sulfur. Reading from a little article here. Sulfur is among the most biologically abundant elements in the human body with functions including cellular signaling, detoxification of free radicals, structural support, and assisting in energy production. I think it's really interesting when we look at how sulfur is used in the body and, and then we connect it to some of the symptoms of sulfur intolerance. So for example, detoxification of free radicals, assistance of energy production and cellular signaling can you imagine you're probably not going to be feeling very good if these functions in your body aren't working correctly? Now, I know what you're saying. Oh, but I have sulfur intolerance. If I eat all these sulfur foods, I feel really bad. What am I supposed to do? How do I actually tackle this then? Well, my suggestion is that we find a form of sulfur that you can take, that you tolerate as well as you're able to, and we work on very gently increasing this limit. Everyone does better with different forms of sulfur. The form of sulfur that I find most well tolerated is Epsom salts. So this is magnesium sulfate. I found this other really interesting article that I will read for you now. Our phase one detoxification enzymes are cytochrome P450 enzymes. These are critical for detoxifying xenobiotic chemicals and carcinogens. Additionally, they are essential for activating vitamin D, catabolizing vitamin A, and maintaining bile acids production and sulfate supplies. Glyphosate inhibits cytochrome P450 enzymes, causing multiple metabolic disruptions of the function of the enzyme. The reason that I'm sharing this with you is very often sulfur intolerance is connected to, first of all, a sulfate deficiency, and it's normally connected with some type of toxicity. It's extremely uncommon for me to see someone with sulfur intolerance that isn't dealing with either some form of heavy metals, mold or mycotoxin exposure, glyphosate toxicity, or some other form of, of toxins. The point being here that your body uses sulfate to remove these things from, from the body. A part of your detoxification system requires sulfur. So you can get caught in this catch 22 situation where your body doesn't tolerate sulfur because it can't detox and your body can't detox because it needs sulfur. So we need to find a way to get sulfur in. Now I actually have a really cool video that talks specifically about Epsom salts and you can find a link to that video somewhere around here. I will edit it in afterwards. So if you wanna learn more about Epsom salts and how you can use them, especially if you have sulfur intolerance, make sure you click that video. Just briefly, I found the key to be finding a very small dose of a form of sulfur that you tolerate and increase it very gently over time. If this is Epsom salts, I have had clients using a full bathtub with half a teaspoon of Epsom salts and bringing this dosage up very, very gently. And I find the effective dose for most people is usually somewhere between six and 10 cups. So this is a significant amount of Epsom salts, but you have to get there gently and you have to watch for negative reactions. I will also say that I have found this sulfur intolerance is almost always seen with, with individuals that are also intolerant to either oxalates or salicylates. There's a direct connection here because a lot of the processes in your body are connected around these molecules. The third myth that I wanna debunk for you today is that fiber is the only thing that feeds the microbiome. This couldn't be further from the truth. Fiber is a big part of what feeds your microbiome, but there are so many more things. For example, the first one being the mucosal polysaccharides that you actually produce in your own gut. This is why sometimes when people are fasting, they're still having bowel movements. They're still getting bloated and gassy. This is because the organisms in your gut are eating your mucosa. And this is supposed to be this way. Your body wants to feed your microbiome even when you are not eating because you need those microbes to survive. We've developed a relationship with these bugs in our gut. So for example, even when we are fasting, we will produce mucosal polysaccharides. They will eat these mucosal polysaccharides and produce us B vitamins like folate so that we can detox while we're fasting. We don't wanna starve our microbiome, they're working for us. So fibers are one of the things that feed the gut. In particular, the FODMAPs. These are classifications of fibers that are more fermentable than other fibers. But there's a really big part of the plant kingdom that we're missing out if we just look at fibers. And it's really important that we look at this other part because not only can we feed the microbiome, we can also influence the microbiome balance. So going back to the points that we've talked about previously where we have small intestinal dysbiosis, this other compound is helpful in not only feeding selective beneficial organisms, but it kills pathogenic organisms as well. So I have an article for you here. Reading from the article, polyphenols exert their beneficial effects as prebiotic substrate 
On the one hand, by increasing the growth and settlement of the probiotic bacterial families, such as Bifidobacterium and Lactobacillus, and on the other hand, by reducing the number of pathogenic bacteria, such as, such as E. coli, Clostridia perfrigens, and Helicobacter pylori. So this really does emphasize my point now, but also point number one. Polyphenols have an extremely beneficial impact on the microbiome both as a prebiotic and as an antimicrobial. But the key is, when we're using them this way, they're exerting more of a balancing effect instead of a gut-disrupting effect, where we can selectively feed and kill in a perfect balance. So when you read polyphenols here, what does this actually mean? Polyphenols, you can think of these as components of foods that have different colors, flavors, and smells. So to give you an example, think of the compound in blueberries that makes them blue. Being a bit of a nerd, I actually know what this compound is called. This is proanthocyanidins. You can even think in the animal kingdom, think about salmon. What gives it that pinky red color? This is another type of polyphenol. This one's actually called astaxanthin. So these different kinds of colors are a type of polyphenol. But now you can think about smells. Think about the aroma of coffee. Think about the smell of chocolate. Think about that substance in onions and garlic that makes your eyes water and cry. That's a polyphenol. These things all have a significant impact on your microbiome, both feeding and killing in a very specific but balanced way. I will say as well, this is one reason, generally I'm not a fan of isolated prebiotics, like fiber supplements. True, they do have some clearly therapeutic application, i.e. in the first point, but when you're using foods in their whole food form, or for example, juicing them, you're concentrating many of these polyphenolic benefits, but keeping them a little bit broader and a little bit more holistic. The fourth myth that I want to debunk for you today is that oxalates are bad and everyone should avoid them. Now, I know there's probably someone watching that has oxalate intolerance and hearing that is maybe a bit triggering and you think, why would you say such a thing? I'm gonna eat oxalates and I'm gonna feel really bad. I'm not saying that. If you have oxalate sensitivity, if you have oxalate intolerance, then don't eat them. But if you don't have any problems with oxalates, don't avoid them. It doesn't make any sense to avoid a food if you don't have an intolerance to it. We produce oxalates ourselves. There is oxalate in lots of different foods. It's a natural substance. Yes, it can cause problems, but simply avoiding it is not the solution. If you do have oxalate intolerance, you need to look deeper. You need to try and figure out why have you developed oxalate intolerance. One really cool train of thought that I would like to take you on when we're looking at oxalate intolerance is the connection between oxalates and the health of our bile. Now, this is something that I have known and suspected for a very long time, just working with clients, but I actually was doing some research to prepare for this video, and I found a study that, that basically backs this point up with scientific evidence. So this anecdotal experience that I've had is really nice to have it reinforced with some scientific data. So reading from the article for you here, natural conjugated bile acid replacement therapy reduced fecal fat excretion from 119 to 79, and urinary oxalate excretion from 87 to 64. What this means is, the context of this study is that people who have had bowel surgery and are not reabsorbing their bile acids correctly, basically abstracting this out, this would be applicable to anybody that is having fat malabsorption, bile health problems, liver and gallstones, cholestasis, any type of dysfunction in the health of the bile. What this study shows is that poor bile health directly impacts not only oxalate absorption, but also oxalate excretion. Reading further in the article, conjugated bile acid replacement therapy reduced fecal fat excretion, reduced urinary oxalate excretion, and improved nutritional status. So what this basically means is, if you're having oxalate problems, and you also have bile problems, whether that's liver gallbladder issues, fat malabsorption, nutritional deficiencies of the fat soluble nutrients, or even if you have no observable things, you just know you have sluggish bile, as in you've been exposed to a lot of fat soluble toxins in the past. Mercury and other heavy metals, mold, plastics, glyphosate, these are all fat soluble toxins that your body removes in the bile. So instead of just avoiding oxalates for the rest of your life, you need to figure out what is going on with your bile health and you need to fix that. And if we can fix that and get the bile health improved and get that bile flowing correctly and moving and doing its job properly, your tolerance for oxalates will increase significantly. And if you are one of those few people that I do talk with that is just avoiding oxalates because you're scared of them or because you're afraid of all of the stuff you've heard on the internet, stop avoiding foods that you don't have any reactions to. Trust your body more than anyone on the whole internet, even more than your doctor, because your body cannot lie. The fifth myth that I would like to debunk 
is that the carnivore diet is the best diet to heal your gut. So if you're currently on a carnivore diet or if a carnivore diet has worked really well for you in the past, you get a double thumbs up from me. I'm not saying don't do it, but there is never a one size fits all approach for everyone and the carnivore diet doesn't work for everyone. I have tried it, it doesn't work for me. I have spoken with at least 50 people that have tried the carnivore diet and it does not work for them. If you are one of the people that it does work for, awesome. If you're in need of trying an elimination diet because you have a lot of food sensitivities and you wanna try and find some stability or some safety or a new baseline, awesome, use it. But the thing is with the carnivore diet, we don't actually know the long-term impacts on the microbiome. There simply isn't any data. There are only anecdotes. And the anecdotes that we have, they're generally anecdotes of people that have been doing this for relatively short periods of time. Even if you look at people that have been doing this for longer periods of time, say for example, Michaela Peterson, and good on her for figuring something out that works. You know, this completely changed the quality of her life and has enabled her to live a fairly normal life and good for her for doing that. But there simply isn't data. We don't know what the long-term consequences are gonna be. We know that the microbiome is essential for good health. And we just simply don't know the consequences of eating carnivore diets long term. We don't know what happens to the gut. Some things that have been studied in the short term are that we see increases in bacteria that eat meat, and there's no surprise there. The thing is, the byproducts that these organisms produce are things like cadaverine and putrescine, and these are toxic compounds. What I found really interesting though was that many of these substances can be neutralized by certain things like lactic acid. And usually lactic acid is produced in the gut when we feed our probiotic organisms prebiotics. This is one reason things like yogurt and sauerkraut are sour is because these probiotic organisms eat the fibers in these foods and produce lactic acid. And this inhibits the harmful effects of the putrescine and the cadaverine. So what I want you to take away from this is if you're struggling with your gut health, the solution probably isn't as simple as just remove everything apart from meat from your diet. If it is, cool. It is for some people. And if that works for you, then fantastic, do it. But you can get many of the benefits of a carnivore diet by eating more meat and still include selective vegetable matter and, and other food groups that do actually work for you. That consistently, this is a more successful approach for a wider array of people. Myth number six, you must avoid dairy and gluten. This kind of connects to my point about oxalates. If you don't have any observable sensitivities to these foods, you don't need to avoid them. One thing I will say is if you are living in the United States, your foods that contain gluten and your dairy supply are completely different from the rest of the world. I'm quite sure if I went to eat gluten and dairy in the United States, I would feel terrible, but you're not really eating food over there anymore. It's full of chemicals. It's completely different from how these foods originally were. But if you're like me living in Europe, and you can get some, some nice sheep's cheese. If you can get some sourdough bread and you don't have any problems when you eat it, then eat it. If a food is giving you a problem, you will know, you will feel it. But if you eat these foods and you don't feel any worse, and in fact, and this almost makes me laugh, but it also nearly makes me cry. I talk with people all the time that are avoiding gluten and dairy, even though when they eat those foods, they actually feel better because of what people say on the internet. So if these foods don't give you a problem, then don't avoid them. I eat dairy and it doesn't give me a single problem. I had a pizza the other day. Yeah, it made my stomach feel a little bit full, but I had a whole pizza to myself. I can't say it was the dairy, it's probably just me. So if you don't have any observable problems with gluten on dairy, then don't avoid them. Obviously, if you have celiac disease, then don't eat gluten. If you eat dairy and it gives you colitis, then don't eat dairy. But if you're someone that can eat these foods and you don't feel any negative either way, then why would you avoid having these things in your diet? They make your life so much easier. They make your food so much tastier and enjoyable. Don't restrict it for no reason. Myth number seven, saturated fat is bad. So I actually have two contexts for this point. The first being that saturated fat is bad because it's gonna give you heart disease and it's gonna make you have a heart attack and it's gonna clog your arteries. That's one train of thought, we'll go there. The second is that saturated fat is bad because it increases endotoxin absorption. So it increases the amount of substances like lipopolysaccharides that absorb from your gut into your bloodstream. So for the first point, I don't wanna go fully into the whole cholesterol debate. I have another video that talks all about cholesterol. It's a really nice 30 minute in-depth video specifically about cholesterol. If you have interest in that, if your doctors have told you that you're gonna die, like mine told me I was gonna have a heart attack, not in six months, today, because my cholesterol levels were so high, go and watch that video. It will 
it will take all of the fear away that you have about cholesterol. You don't need to be scared of cholesterol and the whole saturated fat cholesterol thing is completely misunderstood, but I explain that in so much more detail in that video. The point that I wanted to cover today is that saturated fat is the best way that we can trigger our bile to release in our intestines. And keeping our bile flowing is essential, not only for the points mentioned previously in the video, oxalate problems, SIBO problems, bile acts like soap in your intestines. So if you have organisms that have translocated where they aren't supposed to be, cleaning your intestine with a nice quality soap is really, really important. If your bile isn't flowing because you aren't eating saturated fat, you aren't getting this cleaning mechanism and you're gonna develop problems. Bile is also how we remove all of our fat soluble toxins. So if you aren't stimulating these bile releases regularly, these toxins are staying inside of your body. There's also another really important point to cover here. Reading from an article, only approximately 5% of these bile acids are eventually excreted. The majority of bile acids are efficiently reabsorbed from the ileum, secreted into the portal venous system and returned to the liver in a process known as enterohepatic recirculation. What this tells us is that bile is so precious to the body that we reabsorb 95% of it. So imagine you have toxins in your body that your body is trying to remove from the bile. It's released, it goes into your intestine. Only 5% of the toxins in that bile are actually gonna leave. The rest are gonna be reabsorbed. So we need to make sure that we keep this bile flowing. And the single best way we can do that is to consume saturated fat and stimulate this bile to be released. The other point about lipopolysaccharides is a valid point. Lipopolysaccharides also being a fat soluble compound, when we eat dietary fat, it increases the uptake of lipopolysaccharide. However, just avoiding fats because of this mechanism doesn't make any sense. If for some reason, you know you have increased permeability or you have increased endotoxin inside of your gut acutely, say for example, you got glutened, you are gluten sensitive and you got glutened, or you ate something that triggered your gut, or you took a higher dose probiotic and it triggered a lot of gut inflammation. What you can do is just strategically avoid fat on that day, or even just fast, just don't eat anything for that day. As soon as your permeability is reduced, your absorption rates are gonna decrease significantly. But ultimately, the solution that we're looking for is, how can we shift the gut microbiome so that we have less of these organisms that produce endotoxin? How can we reduce the amount of lipopolysaccharide that is being produced? And this connects back into the points above about SIBO and small intestinal dysbiosis. We need to correct that microbiome imbalance. The eighth myth that I wanna debunk is that you have to eat perfectly to heal. This helps tie the video together nicely with all the points that I've talked about before, about oxalates, about carnivore, about gluten and dairy. You really don't have to eat perfectly to heal. Your diet is a really important part of the healing process, but perfection is a pursuit that will drive you insane. I ate an absolutely perfect diet for four years straight and it did not heal me. It actually developed into an eating disorder which caused its own challenges, its own problems, and its own physical symptoms inside of my body. The pursuit of perfection in your diet is not a pursuit that I would recommend. I now see the optimal diet of fitting somewhere around 80% great foods, 20% suboptimal foods. And you absolutely do not have to be perfect to heal. If you're finding that you are restricting your diet more and more, you're perfecting your diet more and more, and you're actually not getting any results as a consequence of doing so. You know, if you go carnivore and you get loads of, loads of results, fantastic. But if you're going carnivore, or if you're restricting your diet even more, and it's actually causing more and more problems, we have some deeper layers to this situation that we need to look at and I would be happy to help you do that too. And my final myth to wrap up today's video is that it takes years to heal your gut. So personally, I have been working for years to heal my gut. I'm more of an outlier than most people that I talk with. I can tell you that I have had clients that I have spoken with and within three days of our initial consultation, their digestive symptoms have decreased by 80%. Now this isn't everyone, but in this case, this individual had a very clear cut set of symptoms we knew exactly what we needed to do, exactly the actions that we needed to take, and he followed through in implementation perfectly. So with a couple of changes to his diet, a couple of supplemental adjustments, he was feeling better within three days. This doesn't mean his gut healed. However, if we can reduce the symptoms that you're experiencing, we're aligning you with healing in the long run. Symptoms are an indicator of dysfunction. If you have digestive symptoms, is an indicator that your digestive system is not functioning correctly. If we can correct the dysfunction with dietary and supplemental changes, the function improves and now you're aligned with healing in the long run. I can tell you that this individual stuck with these changes 
and we're talking within 10 to 12 weeks. So this is, this is months, not years. He was back to eating, and he's in the United States, by the way. He was eating cupcakes with gluten in, and he was fine. He wasn't having digestive problems. So if anyone is telling you that this is gonna take years and years and years for you to feel better, that's just simply not true. The journey can be a long one, especially if your health situation is as complex as mine, with five plus root causes, lots of different compounding factors, and throw an eating disorder in there for some good measure. Then yeah, it might take you a little bit of time, but don't let anybody tell you that you can't be feeling better sooner rather than later because I see it every day. Now, if you're interested in having a one-on-one -on -one chat with me so I can take a look at your health situation, help give you not only a time frame of what results I think are realistic in your situation, but to help you plan the three most important actionable steps that you can change or implement to achieve your greatest healing over the next 12 weeks, make sure you click the link at the top of the description below and book a call with me. I hope you found this video really interesting. I hope I've busted several myths. If you disagree with any of my points, I would love to hear it. And if hearing some of these points is like a relief to you, if it allows you to, to let go, to feel softer with this healing process, also let me know, I would really love to hear. Take care, I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.